Hello, no swaitha. God be the fucking kadunyaun. He is hoping that you're all very well. Once again, this week, I'm going to be looking at one of the medieval Welsh poems that concerns the great King Arthur. As we've seen so far, um, especially in that first poem, Arthur and the Eagle, we've seen that Arthur takes up many different types of uh, roles. He's not the great medieval King Arthur that we know of uh, through uh, the medium of continental literature. He's a very diverse character. Uh, and we're going to see another side to this diverse character in this session here. For those of you who have watched the last two episodes, if you like, in this series, you'll kind of know where I'm going with it by now, I'm sure. Uh, and I have covered this poem that we're going to be looking at this evening um, in a video I did a couple of years back on the three romances. Um, it does help us understand a few episodes in the romances. Um, but I'm going to be looking at the prose versions of this idea next week. So next week we'll be looking at an episode from Kilchanolwen and from the Irish Battle of Moitura and perhaps from one or two other traditions also, just to get a flavour of how ubiquitous this idea is, how common it is. This idea of a gatekeeper and the hero needing to prove himself in some way to get into the fortress that the gatekeeper is uh, is guarding. Now, it's not going to be a long one, this session. Um, it's going to be a, a pretty quick run through this poem. I'll, I'll do the whole poem, but to be honest with you, it's not massively enlightening. Um, the the contents of the poem itself. It's more the context of the poem and a few very, very interesting lines in the poem. But generally speaking, the general direction of the poem um, is very typical of uh, medieval Welsh heroic poetry. It's all sort of machismo and, you know, men performing these wondrous deeds in battle and bravery and bloodlust and, you know, blood being spilt. And you can imagine the whole kind of show that goes on. Anyway, let's take a look at it, shall we? Pa gwr, or pa uwr, because medieval Welsh orthography doesn't always capture the mutations, so Pa Uwr is, it's an anonymous poem, and as far as we can tell, it was copied down sometime between 900 and 1100 of the Common Era. Uh, it was copied down into the Black Book of Carmarthen, which is, of course, one of the great uh, medieval Welsh manuscripts. Now, some folks believe that there are signs in the Black Book of Carmarthen copy that this is a poem originally uh, written down in Old Welsh. So from at least as far back as 900. The language has been updated. It's been made contemporary for people to be able to read in the later medieval period. So it's been modernised or updated into Middle Welsh. But we still have some of these clues as to the Old Welsh origins of the poem. So the conservative estimate is 900 AD. It could be much, much older. It could be much, much older. It's difficult to say, yeah? impossible to say. But the fact that it's been copied down and preserved in different manuscripts shows that, you know, people kept returning to it and it was a known piece of work. We don't know how popular it was uh, as an oral piece, but it clearly did exist in an oral setting, at least being read out aloud, if not being preserved on memory and performed. Because it is actually one of these dramatic pieces. It's a theatrical piece. There are two characters. Um, uh, one of them is Glewlwyd Gavelvaur, the gatekeeper to this strange fortress, and the other is Arthur, the great King Arthur, who's boasting and bigging up his men uh, and praising the bravery of some of his more notable warriors. So there is an element of drama. There's an element of play, if you like. Um, and there's also allusions to 
an old idea, an ancient mythology, let's say, to dress up the language a little. It does hint at uh, this idea of the special enchanted fortress playing a very specific role in the heroic culture and in the mythology of medieval Wales. But anyway, let's get on to it, shall we? It begins, what man is the gatekeeper? Or who is the gatekeeper? And then the answer being, Glewlwyd Gafael Fawr. Now, Glewlwyd Gafael Fawr is a very interesting name to begin with. It means something like the bold grey one or the brave grey one. Glewlwyd, bold grey or brave grey. And then Gafael Fawr of the mighty grasp. So we can see that, that, that this Glewlwyd Gafael Fawr is probably some type of brave old man who is still mightily strong. And we'll talk about what he may uh, stand in for in a moment, but he may be a symbolic character himself, a symbol that we can interpret through the meaning of his name. But regardless, Glewlwyd Gavalvaur, what man asks it? Arthur and Kai win, or blessed Kai. Gwyn, of course, white is often symbolically or metaphorically used to describe blessedness or fairness perhaps so this could be blessed or fair kai arthur and kai win and then glowloid asks who travels with you and arthur responds the best men in the world but glowloid's answer to arthur is into my house you will not come unless you reveal them now, there's a question mark by uh, Nerissan Jones, whose translation we're mostly following here, because it really isn't clear what this word is in Welsh. Now, the original Welsh is um, Gwaredi, but Gwaredi isn't a very stable word in this context. We don't really know what it means. Now, Nerissan Jones has opted for reveal, and there are good reasons for that. But, for example, another translator of this poem, Patrick Sims Williams, went for vouch. So, into my house you will not come unless you vouch for them, unless you vouch for these men. But I've got my own pet theory. Guaredi, its stem is guared, yeah? And it's usually used in a religious context to, to mean redeem, as in redemption, as in we are redeemed by the cross, yeah, in a Christian context. So, Glewlwyd Gavelvaud could be asking, you're not coming in, Arthur, unless you can redeem these great warriors, unless you can redeem them, unless you can compensate for their faults in some way. Now, it's not explicit that this is the meaning, but if it is the meaning, uh, after we followed through on my interpretation of this poem, this might become important, so bear it in mind. Bear it in mind. Anyhow. So basically, this is the initial conversation between Arthur and Glewlwyd. Arthur has clearly arrived at some very important fortress, Glewlwyd's property, it's Glewlwyd's fortress, and he's also the gatekeeper, and he's saying, you know, I'm not going to let you in until you reveal them to me or, or vouch for them or redeem them. It's one of those three. It could be all three meanings, we're not sure. I shall reveal them says Arthur. Now that reveal there is the same Gwaredi again, as far as we can tell in the manuscript. So he could be saying, I shall vouch for them, or I shall redeem them, and you shall see them. The vultures of Eli. Uh, Eli, of course, is a river down in southeast Wales. It runs from Tonarevail into Cardiff. So this could be referring to a particular territory that these warriors come from. The vultures of Eli and able men are all three. Mabon, son of Motron. Where have you heard his name before? He's one of the stranger characters in the story of Kiluch and Alwen, who is, of course, rescued from captivity um, by Arthur's men questioning the oldest animals. And these elders in the animal kingdom are the ones who know where Mabon, son of Motron, is. Mabon, son of Motron, his name possibly derives from an ancient Celtic god, uh, Maponos and Motron of course the second element in that name is clearly his mother's name Motron 
relates to the Latin matrona, yeah, uh, that the English matron comes from, simply means mother. Um, there's clearly an Indo-European root to the meaning there. Um, so it could mean something like the blessed son or the divine son, son of the blessed or divine mother. Yeah, it's a very interesting name. Mabon, son of Matron, a character from Kiluch and Dalwen, essentially, in medieval Welsh literature, servant of Ithur Pendragon. This is the only place we find reference to Mabon being a servant of Ithur Pendragon. Cuscaint, son of Banon. We don't know much about Cuscaint, but interestingly enough, Banon means queen. And it's very rare to have a matronymic as opposed to a patronymic, that is, the mother's name coming after the warrior's name. Yeah? So Mabon, son of Motron, Mabon, son of his mother, Motron, and Cuscain, son of Banon, the great queen, his mother. Maybe there's an allusion here to matrilineality being important. We don't know. And Gwyn Godavrion being the third uh, of these vultures of Eli. Gwyn Godavrion again is mentioned in Kiluch and Alwen. Apart from that, little is known of him. His name is interesting because it's his name in particular that points to an old Welsh source for this text. Godabrion in the original points to the antiquity of this poem. Anyway, I digress. Steadfast were my men, defending their just claims or rights. Notice steadfast were my men. The past tense here. They were in the past, yeah? And we find Manawatan, son of Llyr, is one of these uh, mighty men of Arthur's party also, whose counsel was weighty, of great counsel. Manawatan brought back shattered spears from Trevroid, Trevroid probably being uh, one of the sites of Arthur's battles. I have my own interpretation of this section here, which I've covered several times on the Four Branches course, which I'm not going to get into here. But Manawadan from the third branch of the Mabinogi is another one of these great heroes who Arthur is vouching for or is redeeming, is making, you know, uh, boasts uh, on their behalf. And Mabon, son of Melt. He used to stain grass with his blood. He was a great warrior. Now, Mabon, son of Meil, is also mentioned in Kilch and Alwen, as are many of these heroes. As you will notice, there is a very close relationship between uh, this poem and Kilch and Alwen, which we'll touch on in a moment. Mabon, son of Meil, this could be Mabon's father. So whereas we got Mabon, son of Motron, this is Mabon, son of his mother, Modron. This is Mabon, son of his father, Melt. Now, Melt means lightning. That's one possible meaning of Melt, which is interesting. Mabon, son of lightning, yeah? The great son, the divine son, son of lightning. Now, we're not sure if this is exactly the same Mabon or if by this period they had developed into separate characters in the tradition, which could happen. There being a different name, he develops a different story, uh, he develops a, a different set of relations in the network of Welsh storytelling. Or he could be the same character, which would be very, very interesting. It's not explicit, but it's, uh, it's something that we should pay attention to. And he's described here as a great warrior, of course. And Anwas, the winged, and Llwch, Llawenog, they were accustomed to defend at Edinburgh on the border. A lord would give them refuge. We're not sure what this means, but my nephew would avenge. So there's obviously a backstory here. Anwas and Llwch are also characters that are, could be similar to other characters in Kiluch and Alwen. Now, for those of you familiar with Kiluch and Alwen, you will also have picked up that in that story, Arthur's gatekeeper is Glauluid Gavalvaur, exactly the same character as the gatekeeper here. But different to Kiluch and Alwen, in this poem, Arthur is trying to gain entry into this fortress. Yeah? Now, in Kiluch and Alwen, it's Kiluch who's trying to gain entry into Arthur's fortress, of which Glauluid is the gatekeeper. So... It's not an exact um, comparison between both uh, sources. They obviously share in a common body of law, but the poet and the storyteller are making very, very different uses of them. 
Uh, in both stories, Glauloid performs the same role in that he is seeking some assurance that these are worthy men. Kai would plead with them while he killed three at a time. When Kelly was lost, fury was endured. Kai would plea with, plead with them for as long as he cut them down. We're not sure what this is a reference to. It could be reference to a story of Kai um, sort of changing sides and fighting against Arthur's men. And as he's killing them, he's pleading with them to stop fighting him because they're his friends. But for whatever reason, he's on the other side. Very ambiguous. We're not sure what's going on here. Terribly though he laughed. Terribly though he laughed. He caused her blood to flow in a Varnach's hall, fighting he and a hag. Now, this is probably referring to the the giant Urnach. If we amend Avarnach to Urnach, then that would be in keeping with the syllable count of the poem and various other reasons for why we can make that amendation. But Urnach is a giant uh, who is killed by Kai in Kilachandalwen. Now, there's a bit of a mix-up here because it's not Kai who kills the hag in Kilach and Alwen, it's Arthur. He goes off to kill uh, a witch in Kilach and Alwen so as to collect her blood, the blood being one of the very few liquids that can treat us by that end's tangled beard. So we're probably looking at variations of these types of story once again. He stabbed Penpalach in the dwellings of Disethach. Penpalach is clearly some type of monster. On the mountain of Edinburgh, he fought with dog heads, the Cynocephali, of course, known in many traditions from all over the world. The dog heads, yeah, the dog headed monsters. By the hundred, they fell. They fell by the hundred before Betwir, so another one of Arthur's great warriors, the powerful on the shores of Trevroid. This river, which was one of the sites of Arthur's great battles, according to the Historia Britonum. Fighting with Garloid, violence was his nature with sword and shield. We're not sure who Garloid is. Useless was an army compared with Kai in battle. He was a sword in battle. Into his hand pledges were given, so people would pledge to fight alongside him more than likely. He was a steadfast chief, a defender for the good of the land. Bedwyr, then the line, the manuscript is, is corrupted there, so we don't know what it really says. The submitting of 900 and 600 for scattering was the value of his attack. So actually counting the worth, the value of his, ta of his attack by how much he killed and how many he scattered. Now, I used to have men. It was better when they were alive. The rest of the poem kind of goes off on the same trajectory of bigging up and, you know, boasting uh, and, you know, praising the great bravery of these men. But what Arthur's saying there, or what he's suggesting, is that all of these men are dead. All of these men are no longer alive. And yet, he is trying to bring them into Glauluid Gavalvaur's court. Now, the poem is pretty badly mangled in the manuscript, and its end is missing. The, the page is missing. So we don't know how it ends. So there may be some other explanation for what this poem is about. But... Its ambiguity, of course, leads us to interpretation. And all of these little clues in the poem lead me to a very particular interpretation of what's going on here. First of all, we've got Glauloid Gavailvaur, um, the mighty or the, the bold or the brave grey one with the mighty grasp. And this is his fortress that Arthur is trying to get his dead warriors into. He's already said they're all dead, and he's speaking about them in the past tense. And there is a death song sense to the, the whole poem. All these great deeds described in the past tense, or in the, in the imperfect at least, yeah? Talking about them in the past, as if they are done and dusted, as if they're complete. Now, of course, many of you have probably already guessed where I'm going with this. I think that Arthur here is acting as a psychopomp. Now, this is speculation, of course, and plenty of people are going to uh, disagree with my interpretation here, but I think that's what's going on. 
I think this is the hero, the hero version or the warrior version of what we find in Pray There Anoven in the poem we looked at last week. I think that in Pray There Anoven, in the spoils of Anoven, that's the bardic version of this. Yeah, It's the bardic version of trying to take the souls of great warriors, three whole shiploads of Pradwen, into the other world, into what might be called a Welsh Valhalla, for example, a great feasting hall where the warriors go to after death. Yeah. Now, of course, there are plenty of good reasons why Scandinavian mythology might be similar to Welsh mythology. They are both ultimately Indo-European mythologies. They're cousin mythologies in many ways, and they're also next door to each other. The Celts and the Germanic tribes have lived side by side and fighting each other and murdering each other and side by side in peace again for a very, very long time. There might be some cross-cultural influence, we're not sure. But what I find interesting about this poem is that Arthur is acting as a psychopomp, wanting to lead perhaps the spirits of his dead into the other world, into the... Uh, the, the stronghold that is guarded by a death figure, the grey one, the bold grey one with the mighty grasp, with the strong grasp, yeah? I think that's a pretty good description of death, don't you? Someone who is bold and mighty and yet is grey. Grey perhaps in terms of being related to the Tulitig, the fair folk, grey being their colour very often. Um, but also perhaps as in an aged or old man, yeah, someone who's connected to old age. And then we have the mighty grasp, someone who Ned doesn't let go of you once he's got you, just like death. Now, if this is the case, if my interpretation holds water, and, you know, there's no guarantee that it does, it is just a, a hypothesis at this point, um, if it does hold water, it means that praising or boasting or talking up the heroic exploits of heroes, of warriors, is one way of ensuring they live on in the other world. Now I am pulling at the slightest of strands here, yeah? I wouldn't like to say grasping at straws, but that would be another way of putting it. Kindelo Bradid Maur, in one of his poems, one of the he's one of the greatest court poets of the um, 12th century, of course, if not the greatest court poet. In one of his poems, um, he describes the Awen as Awen Dhoven or Dhoven Govyain, the deep Awen of deep recollection, of deep memory, as if Awen arises from the deep place which is akin to cultural memory akin to um to how people are remembered yeah is this poem alluding to a similar concept whereby it's the great heroic feats which people remember which ensure the warriors pass on into the other world it's the fact that we remember the ancestors, which means that they live on. Now, this isn't unique to the Welsh tradition, of course. There are plenty of other traditions which have a, a similar belief that paying respect to the dead, that remembering them, um, respecting the ancestors, ensures that they live on. Not only in our memory, but memory as in a, a supernatural special dimension which is timeless, which is out of time, but that... Living mortals maintain that timeless dimension by referring to it and addressing it and bearing it in mind. Now, of course, this is a very un-Christian concept uh, uh, and it may not chime that well with the dogmatic Christianity of the 9th, 10th, 11th, 12th centuries. I don't know. So this poem might not explicitly express this idea, but it might preserve in a fossilized state this concept, which may still have been a popular, at least motif in poetry uh, in the, the Dark Ages, in the early medieval period. 
Of course, I'm going to move on next week into talking about the prose sources for this idea, for this notion. Um, and we're going to fill out this idea next week by referring back to the poem of Arthur and the Eagle and Pray the Anovn and this poem Pa Urir Porthor because I think they all three hint at this meaning. In the poem Arthur and the Eagle, of course, Arthur is speaking to the dead, a transmigrated soul in the form of an eagle. Yeah. In um, Pray the Anovn, there are hints that the other world is a place of death. It is a place of not only a great bloodshed, but a place perhaps which is very closely associated with death, where the dead actually go. The fact that only seven return from this battle might just be a later addition to this idea, or it might refer to reincarnation. Only seven came back. Only seven souls reincarnated next time round. Reincarnation is a very obvious theme in the tale of Taliesin, of course. Taliesin is very closely associated with this idea of a soul returning uh, into mortal form. And then we have this poem, which looks like an elegy, a death song, a celebration of the dead and that celebration of the dead ensuring their survival or the, their continuation, that their great feats are remembered uh, and they therefore live on in an otherworldly fortress that's guarded over by the symbolic figure of death.